So let's get going. We've got roughly an hour to get uh, through quite a lot of material I have selected today. We're going to talk about gender. We're going to talk about sexuality, of course. Objectification. This is a term used a lot in academia to mean that somebody has been turned into an object, right? That somebody's uh, identity has been hijacked by somebody else and it's been reduced to um, something a lot more simpler that can be utilized for one's own pleasure. And of course, we're going to think about expression. What does it mean to express one's own gender or sexuality in art? So now that we're ready to go, here's my legal disclaimer. So you can't sue me, right? It's a joke, but it's fun. And we have to have fun, right? On a Monday morning, especially. There you go. Isn't this saucy enough? Yes, we're dialing up immediately. I can't believe I'm showing you this. Far too racy. Venus de Milo. Um, you all remember Venus de Milo, I'm sure. Such an icon uh, of classical art. And I wanted to start from classical art and Venus de Milo because I'm sure you're all familiar with the idea that everyone seems to be naked in classical art. And I find uh, that lots of times people have asked me at the museum as well, why is everyone naked? Well, there are many answers to this important question. First of all, let's say that the Greeks certainly had an appreciation for the naked body. I don't know that we can blame them in that respect. But there is something a little deeper as well that had a major impact on the way we understand nudity in art, in Western art, all the way from classical Greek art to today. The ghost of classical art is what defines our understanding of nudity pretty much uh, every time it appears throughout history. So we're gonna look at that phenomenon. So what is the idea with these beautiful sculptures and why is everyone naked? Why do you need to throw a disc naked, right? We don't see Olympians doing that today. And some of you might advocate for that to be reinstated. The idea is that the Greeks believed in something very important. And this is their motto. Men's sana in corpore sana. So today we even speak Latin. And this actually means a healthy mind in a healthy body. So think about the conundrum here. If that's the value the Greeks wanted to embody, to represent in their sculptures, how do you represent a healthy mind in a sculpture? That's very difficult because sculptures don't speak. Sculptures don't express themselves in any other way than by displaying their surfaces. So it makes perfect sense to create beautiful bodies like this, which actually tell us that inside that beautiful body, resides a beautiful mind. And they really went overboard with this idea. This is something you can do today after the talk just to have fun and play uh, in the house. Uh, you can measure the height of your head and see how many times it fits in your body, right? Uh, this by Polyclitus, this beautiful sculpture, the Doriphorus, was considered to be the quintessential image of harmony when the human body is concerned. And the number of times your head fits into the body is the key to that harmonious look. The Greeks had found out something very important about nature, and that is called the golden section. I'm sure you've heard about this before. It's a proportional ratio that you actually see exemplified on the, uh, in the left-hand corner of this image with the spiral motif that looks a little bit like a shell. And it's a pattern, it's an incremental pattern. It keeps going bigger and bigger, but in, in a proportional way. You can find it in leaves, you can find it in the wings of butterflies, it's everywhere in nature, and it's what makes us say that something is beautiful. Almost subliminally, we perceive something as beautiful when this ratio is 
ingrained in the image. It's part of the composition. The Greeks also applied that notion to their architecture. So you can see uh, the um, image below of a temple like the Parthenon in which the golden ratio plays the same um, role. So the Greeks went really overboard with this idea of perfection. And if you're wondering, oh, is this connected to our idea of what the body should look like today, how we should go to the gym, how we should exercise and have a certain kind of waistline? Yes, blame the Greeks, right? That's where it all began and we never managed to shake this off. The Greeks could have equally sculpted real bodies, right? The bodies of people of all shapes and dimensions, but they decided not to do that because of the important idea we just explored. They wanted to represent the beauty of the mind. And what did they do to us with that idea? As you will remember, the Romans loved Greek art and they appropriated it, right? And this image actually reminds us as well that both Greek sculptures as well as Roman sculptures were polychrome which means that they were colorful, they were painted on, they weren't this white things that we have become used to. Um, the colors faded over time when the um, civilizations that produced the works faded and nobody refreshed the paint. It's one of the biggest misconceptions in the history of art. I often give a talk just about that subject. And of course, this idea of the beautiful body, the white marble, the sensuality that comes with it runs all the way through Western art, like in this beautiful work by Bernini, The Ecstasy of Saint Teresa. And then even more so, nakedness really comes back with neoclassical art during the 18th century and 19th century. You can see here this beautiful work by Canova and another one here, again, Love and Psyche. Now, we have to acknowledge that this kind of nudity is accepted in art as something tasteful, as something that elevates the mind. We look at Psyche and uh, Cupid here thinking about the representation of love. We don't necessarily look at these images with a sense of eroticism, of our it's true that you could at the time. If you lived in the 1700s, this kind of sculpture would have been very uh, erotically charged. But that's because photography hadn't been invented. So the invention of photography in the 1830s changes that idea of eroticism a lot because then people wanted to see pictures of naked people, not paintings of naked people, because they found them more arousing. So let's say that in high society, these kind of sculptures were accepted and celebrated because they elevated the mind, because they made us think about Greek classical values. But somebody didn't agree, and that somebody was called Edouard Manet. I'm sure you've seen the works of Manet. You will remember we had um, a Manet retrospective at the museum um, just about a couple of years ago. Time has warped so much, I can't remember where we are. And, uh, how far ago things went, but um, this painting was in part of the exhibition because uh, it's one of those masterpieces of um, realist French art that doesn't ever live uh, outside of the Musée d'Orsay. It's one of the most important paintings in the history of art because of the scenery here. In fact, many art historians agree that modern art begins with Manet, with this painting, and with the one I'm going to show you in a minute. So, what is going on here? You have to know that this painting upset Parisians like never before, until Manet makes another painting that upset them even more. So what was so scandalous in this painting? Well, first of all, as you can see, the gentlemen here wear contemporary clothing of the time fashionable in 1863. But there's a naked lady there. So it becomes a very enigmatic painting. What is this naked lady doing with this clothed gentleman in the countryside? And let's even consider the lady at the back that seems a little bit out of scale. She looks like a giant, right? That's trying to take over the scene. What is she doing? 
she is washing herself. You can see there that she's pulling water up to her legs. She's um, in a river. Now, Parisians who were familiar with the contemporary climate knew exactly what this painting was about. It was about young people frolicking in the woods, which was happening a lot at the time in Paris. There was a lot of prostitution. Those of you who know well Parisian history or French history of the time and the history of Impressionism know that prostitutes had really become a common occurrence. And of course, high society, Parisian high society, but frown upon it. But we also know that Napoleon III used to go to the brothel. So there was this contradiction here. You can call it mm, hypocrisy. So Manet decides to do something very provocative. Instead of painting something from the past, some beautiful sculpture that makes us think about Greek mythology, he says, why don't we paint today? And why don't we accept that this is today's society. Clearly something has happened. You can see that the basket here on the left hand side has been knocked over, right, with the bread and some of the fruits for this breakfast being spilled. And you can see that this lady here looks back at us with a sense of confidence and disregard. She seems to say, so what? This is what we do. If you're wondering about the lady washing at the back, that's even more incriminating. It might not mean anything to us today. But at the time, syphilis was really rife in, in Paris. And officials, health officials, had asked prostitutes to wash themselves between customers in order to contain the infection. Not good advice, not good enough, right? As you can see, history repeats itself, right? Still getting lousy advice in 1863 about syphilis. We get lousy advice about COVID in 2020. But uh, to Parisians who lived at the time, that lady said it all. It's like, this is a murky painting that has to do with this honesty of what happens in Parisian society. But Manet, who was lambasted for this painting, had a trick up his sleeve. And that trick is related to this. Now look carefully at the right hand side of this beautiful engraving of a work by Raphael that's been lost. And you will see somewhat a familiar composition. You see that lady that looks back on the right hand side in the lower corner, you can see two gentlemen. And if I bring you back here, you might notice some similarities. There they are again. Here they are, even closer. Oh, what did Manet do? He was really out to provoke people, and he decided to borrow this composition from a masterpiece by Raphael, who's a classical monster, but update it to contemporary times, and playing with this notion of who can be clothed and who can be naked. That is what really upset people. You can see here, it's pretty much the same work, but reinvented for contemporary times. So those who said to Manet, this is disgusting, it doesn't have anything to do with classical art, he could say, well, no, look, it does. I just, you know, pretty much lifted the composition from here and these people are naked too. Why aren't you upset about these people being naked, but you're so upset about this woman being naked? See this smart trick? Manet was really, really clever, and he had understood one thing, that painting can make people think about society instead of uh, just making people think about beautiful things. And you can see here another um, example of a painting that inspired another master of the Renaissance, Giorgione, who inspired uh, the painting by Manet. Then this happened, an insult to Manet's rebellious will. Alexandre Cabanel wins the prize at the Salon, the first prize. So the Salon was this big exhibition that happened in Paris every year. You have to imagine a world without TV, cinema, these big exhibitions that happened once a year were such an occurrence. 
and thousands of people went to them. So that's where you saw the most paintings ever in your life. This won the first prize, and this was also purchased by Napoleon III. So double stamp of approval for Alexandre Cabanel, who became a star. But Manet was really upset. It's like, really? 1863, my painting gets laughed at and criticized because there's a naked woman in it? And this one gets all the attention and applause? What is going on with French society and this hypocrisy? Well, look at the difference. This is a Venus. The title says the birth of Venus, right? So this trick of the mind to position the naked female body in the past as, as part of classical mythology makes it acceptable. Even if this is quite explicit, if you ask me, I actually call this uh, painting with my students the post-orgasmic Venus, because you can see here that there's this idea of something that may have happened, that it's very elusive. However, won the first prize, everyone was happy, apart from Manet, who decided to reassess his discontent with this hypocrisy and created this. This is the atomic bomb of modern art, and it's called Olympia. It's also from 1863. As you can see, that was a very good year for Manet, very busy provoking the world. This time, Manet decides to be even more direct. It's like, okay, you're not getting my sophisticated reimagining of Raphael. I'm gonna present you with a prostitute. Clear and simple, posing like a Venus. So you can see here Olympia, who's a prostitute reclining here on her bed. The, the sheets are ruffled and clearly some action has happened in this bed. And she is so good at her job that she even receives a bunch of flowers from admirers. So this was another massive scandal in Parisian society. You're probably wondering why would they be so upset after all, they just celebrated this very explicit Venus and they thought that was good. I can show it her to you again. Oop, not this one, but this one. So this one was okay and actually more than okay, but this one, the end of the world. Well, the problem is really with the fact that Manet gives away this lady as a prostitute, not as a Venus. And there are many details here that once again tell us he's played the same trick. Look, this is a painting by Titian. You can see he has used to inspire himself. Titian, revered as a master, but of course he's painting something in the Renaissance. So this is about the classical love and Greece once again. The title is Venus. And here, another painting that inspired Manet, Adanae, an alternative option to the Venus to represent the female naked body. You can see how similar these paintings are. But Olympia does something, especially to the Parisians who saw it at the time, that we're a little bit immune to because we have seen so much already. To the Parisians at the time, there were details that looked really inappropriate like the choker. The choker was a clear sign of prostitution and the Parisians knew it. The flower in the hair was also a sign of prostitution. They knew it. So you can see how this, this woman screams, I'm a prostitute, not a Venus. And look at the hand. The hand is the most powerful statement ever made in a painting of this kind. While the Venus by Cabanel is offering herself, you know, with that very dramatic pose. Here, Olympia prevents us from looking at her private parts. And that hand says, mm -mm, not going to happen until you pay. She's also looking back at us. You can see the maid here, which was another big scandalous um, element in the painting because the Parisians didn't want to see black people in paintings, and the black cat here by your feet, which symbolizes witchcraft, the idea that prostitutes at the time mingled with the very powerful in society. Also, the shoes, they might not look too, um, you know, overt to us, but they're frivolous. A Venus would never wear that kind of slipper in bed. So you can see how this painting really upset Parisians. That painting 
reverberates through the history of art so much that we find contemporary artist Yasumasa Morimura making his own interpretation of what it meant to grow up in Japan with ideas of beauty that were derived from the Western canon, from Western culture. And you can see him here posing himself as a different kind of Olympia and also as the black maid offering flowers. He would revisit this theme in 2018 where you can see updating the subject. This has become a little bit like his Phil Rouge, you know, his uh, recurring idea that he's explored over time. So it gives you an idea of how important Olympia has become over time as a reference point because of what it accomplished. I also wanted to show you another take on this subject by Lucian Freud. Some of you might be familiar with the work of Lucian Freud. He was the um, nephew of Sigmund and he became one of the undisputed masters of the naked uh, body in the last century. In this case, as you can see, he's breaking the mold of classical art. And in fact, he was accused lots of times of painting what others called ugly people. These are the real bodies. This is being joyfully comfortable with one's own body without those prescriptions imposed by the Greeks on this idea of what the body should look like to represent a healthy mind. So I wanted to bring you back again now. We've gone a little bit into the modern and contemporary to see how uh, contemporary artists have taken up this idea still, so important it is. But let's think about the male body for a little while. Why not? Same applies. This idea that the male body is not always good was very powerful at the same time as Manet explored the intricacies of the female body. So David, Michelangelo, you're all familiar with them. You probably wondered, why does he have to be so naked? You might not complain about it, but again, the same idea applies. This is a Renaissance sculpture that um, re-envisioned ideas of that Greek art valued. So the nakedness of David symbolizes, and the fit body symbolizes this idea of strength in the mind. It's all about the mind, right? You shouldn't be looking anywhere else. So in this case, there's no problem, right? The nakedness is accepted by society as a sign of strength. But when our amazing artist, Gustav Kaibot, exhibited this painting, it was mayhem. Do you remember Gustav Kaibolt? You've got, we've got a beautiful Kaibolt at the museum with the umbrellas, right? Uh, Pirate, pa Paris Street, rainy day from 1886. I miss that very much right now. Um, Kaibolt was a very unconventional artist. Like, you know, in Paris Street, rainy day, he crops the image with the umbrellas coming in, very modern. Here, he decided to create this painting of a nobody. This is man at his bath, but it's anonymous. David is an important historical biblical figure. So it makes sense to aspire to his greatness by looking at a sculpture that immortalizes those values. But the question people ask themselves is like, why are we looking at the buttocks of this man coming out of his bath? See how the context is everything. He was accused of homosexuality and the painting was taken down from more than one exhibition. And in one case in the United States, it was exhibited behind closed doors in a separate room because people thought it was so shocking. Isn't that strange? It's like you've seen frontal nudity all the time, but this specific painting is shocking. So it reminds us of that hypocrisy. What is wrong here? Well. Question, why are we looking at this man? Where are we looking? You know, are we looking through a keyhole? Are we in that room and we shouldn't be in that room? And why do we get to look at his back? And why something so mundane, something so private and meaningless, like drying up after a bath? So what I'm trying to convey here is this idea that ultimately, um, what we can accept when the naked body and sexuality is concerned at this time in the history of art is really dependent on context. 
And when the context changes, the same image or the same kind of nudity becomes unacceptable and it causes a scandal. It's really interesting, uh, a really interesting phenomenon. Now, I wanted to talk to you briefly about another fantastic artist from the same time, Mary Cassatt. You will remember that the Impressionists were predominantly male, a male gang of uh, artists who loved to do one thing. They loved to paint outdoors. You will remember that Monet strongly advocated uh, to go outside, leave the studio behind, and capture the reality of everyday life and the quality of lighting of everyday life. And uh, Mary Cassatt and also Bert Morisot, the two uh, female protagonists of Impressionism, would have loved to be able to do the same. However, they couldn't. It might sound a little strange to um, some of you, but I actually in part lived this experience myself through the memories of my mother who lived in the south of Italy. Um, not in the 18, not in the 19th century, but in the uh, 1950s and 60s, and who, like women who lived in France in the 19th century, could not walk alone the streets of our village or city. That was massively limiting to artists like Mary Cassatt and Bert Morisot, who wanted to go out there like Monet, Renoir, and Sisley and paint what they saw. The implication of a woman alone around the streets of Paris, not chaperoned by a mother or a brother or a father, was that they would be considered prostitutes. So, sadly enough, Mary Cassatt and Bert Morisot paint outdoors, but they paint often in gardens. So next time you have the chance to look at their repertoire, pay attention to that. They paint on balconies, in gardens, sometimes at the theater, places that they could explore either on their own, but with the privacy and safety that they deserved, or in which a male chaperone could be with them without feeling the, um, you know, the weight of having to be with them for extended periods of time and make paintings. So I wanted to start to introduce also this idea of how women artists were limited at this time in what they could represent and how male artists really painted women a lot, preferably naked, right? So we're gonna see how in time this circumstance changes mostly because of female artists taking charge. But before we get there, I wanted to focus on a couple of instances that are very interesting when it comes to the representation of the naked body. One is called Orientalism, the other is called Primitivism. And I'm going to really compress this because we could be here for days just talking about this. What is Orientalism? Orientalism is a fetishization, a very strong objectifying interest for what in the 19th century was called the Orient. The Orient was not China and Japan so much as it was um, the Middle East, the northern coast of Africa. Uh, Dominic Ang, as you can see here, was one of the masters of Orientalism, and he made a fortune selling these paintings. The key character of Orientalism is the odalisk. The odalisk was not a prostitute. It was one of the concubines of the sultan who lived in a harem. And the concubine, the, the odalisk was extracted from the culture of the Middle East and imported into the fantasies of British and French high society through these paintings in which, as you can see, the odalisk poses as a titillating, uh, beautiful creature, preferably with a very fair skin, waiting for a man to arrive. So Orientalism really plays an interesting and, again, hypocritical trick on the female body. It objectifies the female body and he makes it acceptable. Like you're probably wondering, well, is this acceptable? People were buying these paintings. Yes, they were, they loved them, but Manet is not acceptable. Yes, because in this case, these women 
looked very far away. They looked distant. They belonged to a world that was a world of fantasy to the British and French men of the time. So you can see again how if the representation of the female body or male body is contextualized in a faraway world of imagination, then it's fine, even if it's photographs. But if you bring that female body too close to the contemporary time, then we have problems. We can somehow accept the past or the idea of a different country being sensual, but we find it very difficult to accept the representation of our society saying something we might not agree with, we might find decadent. Look at Ang in this Turkish bath scene. I think his question was, how many naked women can I fit in one painting? Boom, bingo, got it. The Turkish bath. And again, look how he turns the Turkish bath into this fantasy of sensuality where women are hugging each other. Totally different from what is going on in the Turkish bath. But it doesn't matter. He is using the female body, the idea of this fantasy that's not Western to objectify, turn the female body into an object to sell through his paintings. The Times also play with the, the notion of very young female bodies, as you can see here, and also juxtaposing the whiteness of the skin to the blackness of the skin here to create this sense of distance and what is allowed in some society and what is not allowed in other society. It is in that context that we can also tackle primitivism, another big, big concept when it comes to the representation of nudity. Primitivism is very much like Orientalism. It's a form of ob objectifying the naked body, in this case, of people of color. We're thinking about um, discovering and extracting more and more from Africa, South America, indigenous people, aboriginal uh, cultures, and turning those into fantasies. It happened a lot, like Matisse, as you can see here. And it's all related to the rise of anthropology. You will remember the rise of this subject during the 19th century, where white men predominantly went to explore indigenous cultures in order to understand the secrets of humanity. And of course, that too ended up objectifying women, especially. Do you remember good old Gauguin? I'm sure you do. Now, good old Gauguin has had a bit of a um, kind of rocky time recently because his reputation has been revisited. That is because he really took part into this process of colonial objectification, which meant, means that during colonialism, uh, it was easy for the colonizers to look at people who lived in the colonies as objects to dispose of. Now, Gauguin left uh, France in 1891. He was very tired of Europe because Europe didn't understand his talent, or so he claimed. And uh, one of the things that's interesting about um, Gauguin and his journey to Tahiti is that he left France wanting to embrace what he thought was this wild paradise. But when he arrived there, after weeks and weeks at sea, he was heartbroken to find that Tahiti was not what he was told it was. The French government had been lying about what was happening on Tahiti, they wanted the French people to be proud of owning a beautiful, exotic land far away that they could dream about. It was a power statement for French society. But when Gauguin arrived there, he noticed that the island had been ruined by plantations, so there was very little of it that was very wild, and that the locals, which is what he was interested in getting to know, had been relegated to the le least pleasant sides of parts of the island while the French had taken over the rest and had turned everything into mini France. So he saw everywhere he went, French bars, French fashion. It was really not what he hoped for. 
at that point, Gauguin had a choice. He could have returned to Paris and just said, okay, well, that was not what I wanted. And I have to admit defeat, or I can make it up. And which one do you think he went for? He made it up. So every painting by Gauguin you see of the Tahitian period is posed, contrived, artificially put together through his imagination. These naked ladies weren't hanging around anywhere with these beautiful trays positioned strategically under their breasts, I'm sure you have noticed. Uh, on the islands, the island had been converted to Christianity well before uh, Paul Gauguin arrived, and therefore the Christian missionaries had imposed a no nudity in public restriction. So you can see here, whether in public, whether in private, that is what Gauguin paints all the time. Why is Gauguin painted all these naked women, regardless of the fact that they didn't exist anymore? in Tahiti, because he is celebrating this idea of nudity in relation to nature. I can be naked in nature because I am not like Western people who have civilized themselves so much that they don't know what nature is and being at one with nature escapes them. So you can see the kind of fantasy he's trying to sell the kind of idea that he's trying to sell. And of course that becomes a bit of a problem, especially when his plan was to return to Paris five years later with all these paintings of naked women capturing this beautiful paradise that doesn't exist in order to become rich. That we call objectification. Unfortunately for Gauguin, it didn't work. Somehow nobody liked those paintings and he returned to Tahiti after contracting syphilis and was heartbroken when he arrived, he was caught in a bit of a horror movie where things become cyclical and you can't snap out of your nightmare. When he arrived in Tahiti, his brain was already being impacted by syphilis and he complained in a letter to his friends in France saying that the beautiful Tahiti he left, which had never existed at that point, had been ruined by the French. Isn't that tragic? He had started to believe that his paintings told the truth about the Tahiti he experienced before. And as part of that, he also managed to get himself a new wife. The previous one I showed you was his underage wife he had, but then when he returns to Paris, fails to sell paintings and returns to Tahiti, he gets a new wife, because that's how it worked for him at the time. And of course, Henry Rousseau, at the time is another artist who engages with primitivism, as you can see here, painting these beautiful, mysterious ladies with snakes. Uh, he never left Paris. He never saw forests or tropical realities. Again, this is a construction. It's made up. This idea that ultimately the um, uh, less developed uh, individual as they thought at the time uh, in, in Britain and France, you know, the idea that who lives uh, and in an indigenous culture is less developed, is happier than we are because we are not subordinated by classical culture, religion, and other impositions that make us unhappy in the West. And you can see here how uh, Henry Rousseau continued with, to explore this theme of the naked female body in nature as part of this idea of harmony. Back to Gauguin real quick, uh, because we're moving into Picasso. I wanted to show you this sculpture that uh, Gauguin made and that he wanted. This is meant to be a um, Haitian goddess he invented. And uh, he wanted this to be used as his tombstone, which actually has been used in Tahiti where he's buried. And one person who was really fond of um, this sculpture was Picasso. Picasso was hugely inspired by Gauguin. You can see here different views of Oviri and how um, Gauguin invented the iconography of Oviri here. And of course, uh, Picasso was also interested and inspired by African art. He used these African masks that he found uh, on the markets in, uh, in Paris and at the Ethnographic Museum in Paris to escape the constrictions of classical art and create one of his 
incredible masterpieces, the Damoiselles d'Avignon. I'm sure you're familiar with this. This is uh, prostitutes parading for a client. And as you can see on the right hand side, uh, Picasso uses African masks in ways that are still very uh, mysterious to art historians. Some art historians claim that he wanted to add a um, racial connotation. Others claim that he wanted to represent the prostitutes as being dangerous because um, prostitutes, non-white prostitutes, began to be seen as carriers of diseases more than white prostitutes at the time. So you can see here how uh, Picasso puts together an image of a sexuality that it's perhaps dangerous and maybe risky and appealing for that matter. There is Picasso looking a little depressed in his youth, surrounded by the beautiful African artifacts he collected. And I wanted to start moving away a little bit from sexuality to think about gender and how gender impacts the way in which we also assign roles in society. Anna Hock was a fantastic artist in the Dada movement. She's one of those artists who has been kind of sidelined. We're going to talk about artists that have been, female artists that have been sidelined in the history of art. And she worked with collage. You can see here that she cuts away at different magazines and newspapers to create a photo montage in which the idea of the father is completely turned upside down. This is a father wearing heels and taking care of a baby, something that in the 1920s was unthinkable. Similarly, she poses questions about beauty. And you can see here in the beautiful girl, the idea of time, women and the notion of women having a shelf life and a certain, um, and the, the idea that ultimately beauty is what characterizes uh, the worth in women. But she was also very avant-garde when it came to her conceptions of race and classical beauty. You can see here in this beautiful photo montage called Love, in which the idea of love transcends the notion of race, transcends the notion of classical beauty. There's a bit of a Venus pose that we see here, but there's also this strange creature that looks like a bit of a dragonfly coming around, perhaps supposing that love, being in love with somebody, being attracted to somebody is like insects when they fly around a light or when they obsess about something they're interested in. So Anna Hock really broke the mold of gender and um, sexuality in the 1920s. Frida Kahlo, of course, one of the most important artists of the last century. You will remember that Frida had a very difficult life because of uh, her disability that she had to um, contend with uh, in the first part of her life. And then again, uh, due to the terrible accident she um, had later on in life. So her body is a very important political tool in her paintings. The body of Frida Kahlo is a battlefield, is a ground upon which she negotiates her identity. And this is perhaps one of our most uh, clear paintings when it comes to the power of the body and the idea of self-expression. Remember when earlier I said, we're gonna look at this idea of expression of sexuality. This is a self-portrait of Frida herself sitting on a chair surrounded by her hair. You can see that she's just cut her hair and it's very important that she holds the scissors. See that detail, tells us that she's in charge of her hair. And what happens here might not be as uh, meaningful or illuminating if we don't consider the biographical moment in which Frida Kahlo creates this painting. This was made just after she divorced Diego Rivera. And you will remember that Diego Rivera wasn't particularly faithful and made Frida Kahlo very unhappy in her life, although they then end up marrying again. But cutting her hair was a sign of strength, a sign of um, independence, because Diego Rivera loved uh, her long hair. So to actually remove, cut what Diego loved was a way for her to empower herself and to really 
uh, own this identity that it's no longer female, that it's no longer passive, and that it's no longer traditional. So you can see here how uh, her hair becomes this incredibly powerful statement. And when it comes to powerful statements and women and de-objectifying women, you can see how Frida Kahlo really didn't make herself into an object. She is the protagonist. She is in charge of her representation. Judy Chicago made this incredible work that I suggest if you have not seen uh, in person, you should certainly go and explore uh, at the Brooklyn Museum of Art in New York when traveling becomes again uh, an option. So first of all, uh, what is it? It's a triangular table, as you can see here, which represents 1,038 women in history. 39 women are represented by place settings that you see here on the top surface. And another... another, 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 another I think somebody unmuted themselves and I'm getting some people. You just make sure... Yeah. Sorry, we need to make sure everyone is moving. Okay, I don't know if we are. Okay, I think I've done it now. So please make sure you don't unmute yourself. Otherwise, we'll just get this feedback and um, it will make things more complicated for us. So I'm just returning here. I um, just wanted to say that uh, 999 names are inscribed in the heritage floor on which the table rests. So when you visit this installation, you can actually walk around the table. It's massive. And you can see the names of these women and observe the plates. Now, one of the things that's fascinating about the, um, this dinner party is that it echoes the idea of the dinner parties that... Um, characterized female societies at the beginning of the last century, the idea of the female club in which ultimately um, women could talk about uh, subjects they cared about. And this kind of representation here is provocative because each uh, plate is actually reinventing the shape of a vagina. And it's in a way making visible what have been made invisible over time and over the history of art. This was considered extremely provocative, and of course it's also seen as particularly um, confrontational. I just wanna, but it's really about recovering powerful women from history, those who have been omitted from history, and give them a place back at the table in the notion, the value of their being women. That's what um, this beautiful work accomplishes. So you can see how elaborate it is. This is not only made by Judith Chicago, she actually worked with the community to create uh, the plates. And uh, so it's a kind of communal effort. And just because of time, I'd love to be here longer, but we can't. I wanted to uh, mention to you the work of the Guerrilla Girls. So we're now getting into feminist art of the 1970s and 80s. And the Guerrilla Girls um, really made a number of works of art in which uh, they just state the truth about the matter. So their works of art, you may have seen them at the museum. We have a few pieces by them look like posters. They look like messages that are being sent um, to an audience in a quite clear, straightforward way, almost advertising way. And you can see that the messages they send are very worrying and unfortunately um, not much has changed when uh, it comes to the position of women in museums. Uh, this is one of the most cynical ones. You know, the advantages of being a woman artist, working without the pressure of success, not having to be in shows with men, having an escape from the art world in four freelance jobs, knowing your career might pick up after you're 80, being reassured that whatever kind of art you make, it will be labeled feminine, 
not being stuck in a tenure teaching position. As you can see, it's all very humorous, but also very bitter. It's, it's uh, a way to highlight the way in which women have been marginalized over time as protagonists in art. So how many women had one person exhibitions at New York City Museums last year? Guggenheim zero, Metropolitan zero, Modern one, and Whitney zero. So just by collecting data, they've really showed also connections between sexism and racism, as you can see here. And this is probably their most famous uh, piece, the most recognizable, which really ties in well with what we have seen today. Do women have to be naked to get into the Met? Well, there you have your uh, reinvention of the uh, odalisk by Ang that I showed you just a second ago. So we're nearing the end of uh, our lecture with a few more contemporary examples. And I wanted to briefly talk to you about Cindy Sherman, who's one of the most important protagonists of contemporary art. I always like to remember, you know, at the museum in the modern wing on the second floor, we have a beautiful collection of works by Cindy Sherman that I'm going to show you in a minute. And I always, uh, I've always liked to re remind people that Cindy Sherman was a true pioneer. She still is, she's still with us. Uh, because when she worked in the 1970s, not only she was a female artist who faced a lot of uh, challenges in uh, just because of the establishment being particularly patriarchal, but because she was a female artist working with photography. And photography has always been a very masculine medium because it involves chemistry, it involves measuring, it involves the technology of the camera. Women have not been uh, historically invited into the use of that medium. So always remember that female photographers of this time, the pioneers of the 70s, like Cindy Sherman, Nan Golden, they really had to push very, very hard to get recognized. Back to our gender and sexuality, Cindy Sherman explores femininity through her own image. So in every image you see, you're looking at her. It's Cindy Sherman posing as a character, a different woman that she tries to embody. And I wanted to show you images from the series we have at the Art Institute. You will probably recognize them. This is part of a series that was commissioned by Art Forum, one of the most important art magazines uh, in the world, they asked Cindy Sherman to make a series of works based on the uh, centerfold. You will remember the centerfold. The centerfold was big in things like Playboy, right? You look at the beautiful pictures and then you get to the centerfold where you get the money shot. It's bigger, it's beautiful and all that. So that's why the pictures are so horizontal, right? Because she's playing with that format. However, she said, instead of presenting the viewers with um, these beautiful bodies of women that have been turned into pretty objects for men, I am going to present women who are emotionally present and caught in moments of vulnerability and anxiety. So she's basically trying to bring back the psychology of being a woman in the mind. You can see here how this woman is looking at the phone, hoping for it to ring for whatever reason. This woman looks uh, distressed in bed, perhaps. This other one uh, looks upset. So what Cindy Sherman tried to do was to really bring back emotion into the representation of women, an emotion they own, an emotion that hints at violence they may have received. So this idea really counterbalances the notion of playboy and the, uh, the centerfold. And I think it's extremely powerful. It was so powerful that in 1981, Art Forum rejected the work. So they commissioned it, and when she presented the portfolio for publication, they said, we are not going to publish it, which was, of course, a big disappointment for Cindy Sherman, but that turned out to work really well for her because this series has now become extremely iconic. And in 2011, 
um, this very picture from the series was purchased for $3.89 million, making it at that point the most expensive photograph ever sold. It is kind of strange that this would be the picture, and this picture itself might be the reason why Art Forum didn't want to publish the work. You can see here that if in the previous images, Cindy Sherman poses herself as a distressed woman, in this, she looks more um, concerned with fantasizing an encounter. Now, you, will know what this is. My 20 years old students have a very hard time understanding what this is. But this is a tear out from a classified ad, uh, ads uh, magazine. And I don't know how good your environment at school was uh, back in those days, but in my days, it wasn't particularly good. And there was always one of these classified ads uh, magazine running around because it was fun to read the ads in which people looked for somebody else in sometimes very colorful ways. You know, I'm looking for a plumber to do this and that, and you knew what it was. So at the time we used to kind of like pass these magazines around and giggle at the ads. We went as far as ringing some of those numbers at the phone box outside the school a couple of times. But I remember sometimes and the magazine would disappear and you thought, Ooh, who, who brought it home with them? And what if you actually called one of those numbers in the privacy of your home? And would you follow through with encountering these people? So these classified ads, especially in the 80s, uh, when I grew up, had a very important uh, value for teenagers. And that's what Cindy Sherman is trying to uh, capture here. This allusion to the growing up, coming of age to a young lady who is now fantasizing about an encounter. So yeah, interesting to see how um, Art Forum had a problem with this series. And problems are typical of the representation of sexuality and gender. Of course, Robert, Robert Mapplethorpe, as you will remember, uh, had the show canceled in 1989 because it was deemed too racy and too uh, forthcoming when it came to explore issues and representations of homosexuality. This is really about bringing to the fore a world that most people had never encountered through beautiful photographs that perhaps were found to be too revealing by some. This self-portrait by Robert Mapathorpe also, um, for as sweet as it looks, upset people. There is, again, something about the blurring of gender that uh, can become difficult to process for some because it hints at an instability or an unknowability, the impossibility of knowing what to expect from somebody. And that's why some of these artists uh, during the 70s and 80s really capitalize on the power of these images and want to change people's minds and create empathic bridges with people to tell them that there's nothing to fear. A contemporary artist you may have seen who also plays in a very stylish way with the idea of the body and how positing the body uh, and contextualizing the body changes our reaction is Kahinda Wiley. You probably know that Kahinda Wiley has um, become very famous over the past few years by creating these beautiful portraits of black individuals he finds on the street. So these are all people that he thinks are interesting for whatever reason. And then he paints them in these beautiful um, Baroque-inspired contexts in which you can see that they're elevated. They still preserve their everyday clothing, but they're elevated like Napoleon would be elevated or you know, important historical figures. He plays that trick over and over, just painting strangers in ways that are very alluring and very uh, inspiring. And here, more recently, he's actually started to uh, play with this notion of masculinity and how you can um, create images that subvert that notion, especially the notion of homosexuality and masculinity in the black community. So you can see here that the pose 
is what you would most readily associate with uh, a female body. And in fact, Kainde Wiley has borrowed the pose directly from this classical sculpture by Clésinier. And you can see here again how he plays with echoes of the past from the 19th century in order to create images that make people ask themselves what is appropriate for a male body? What is appropriate for a female body? And then eventually ask the question, what is appropriate for a male individual and what is appropriate for a female individual? And um, don't go in parks at night, right? I wanted to quickly take you to Japan with this beautiful work by Kohel Yoshiyuki uh, called The Park in uh, 1971. Um, he befriended people who are quite busy in parks at night. And it's actually a really interesting work in which he realized that there was a whole community of um, people having sexual encounters at night. He, had, he said that he had to befriend them and that he had to, well, befriend them as in, you know, he had to be accepted and trusted within that um, uh, group and he then ended up starting to take pictures of them at night of course they didn't know this was happened and you can see here that he really unveils once again like we saw with Mapathor perhaps this kind of underground world that most people are not aware it exists it unveiled this idea of um, casual encounters and sexuality that is um, under the radar that is in a sense provocative and disrespectful of societal uh, rules. And one of the things that's fascinating is that in 1971, when this series was first exhibited, he actually um, exhibited the photographs in a completely blacked out gallery with no light and gave those who entered a mag light to shine around so they would actually encounter the photographs as if you were to wander around the park at night. So yeah, stay away from parks at night. I think it's just a good measure. And uh, another interesting work here when it comes to sexuality and art, this caused a mass massive controversy in 2003 when artist Andrea Fraser, who we see here in the image, sorry, I should have said, this is where it gets racy, right? A little bit racy, at least, uh, for Monday morning. Artist Andrea Fraser actually ended up um, producing a work, uh, a video work that lasts one hour, in which she is seen having sex with one of her collectors. What's the background story? She decided to create this work and contacted her gallery uh, to ask if they could find one of her collectors who would be willing to sleep with her in a hotel room and be filmed as part of the work. They found uh, this person and they remain anonymous. However, they would get one copy of the, the film and the other would be uh, auctioned and sold to other collectors. What is Andrea Frazier telling us with this work? Well, you can read it as a critique of the condition of being a woman in the art world, but you can also read it as the condition that all artists engage with when they become famous and they are represented by a gallery. When you're represented by a gallery, you will have to do things for your collectors. Your gallery will ask you to maybe create work you don't necessarily want to create anymore because your collector requires that kind of work um, to be made. So in this work, she's really exploring this idea, but also this idea of what it means to be free, what it means to express yourself, and what it means to be creatively free as an artist. I just wanted quickly to show you a video by an artist called Castles, who's a transgender artist that works Becoming with an their image, body. Performance and one more camera, example, and then we have completed our journey of gender and sexuality. The blacked out room, the only elements in the space are the image is a performance designed for the camera, performer, specifically the, the act of weighing 1,500 pounds. <laughs> Taking place in the dark in room, room, I use my skills as a fighter space, to unleash an assault where I literally beat the material. Performer and 
In the darkness, I use For the duration of the performance, I am blind. As is the, the audience, as is the photographer. The only light source emitted comes from the flash mounted the duration of the performance, camera. I am blind. As is the audience, as is the photographer. This burst of temporary light allows the audience only light source of the suspended photo from the flash mount to the photographer's camera. The act of photographing is the only way in which this the burst of temporary is light visible. allows the audience to glimpse of the suspended photographs. Okay, so um, Castles is a very interesting artist. I don't know how much you managed to hear from the documentary because my neighbors decided to lift below their garden right now. Uh, but uh, the, the block of clay that they uh, assault is a representation of the challenges that they face in their transgender existence and the idea of having to mold the material of their body, but also having to oppose and fight the resistance of society. And this is a very demanding piece to make in terms of like hitting and hitting and hitting this clay um, boulder that then eventually was cast into different materials and preserved as a permanent sculpture, as a message about the fight, the resistance and the endurance of transgender people. The last piece for today, Jeff Koons and Made in Heaven. Now, I don't know how many of you remember this lady called La Cicciolina, but I certainly do because I grew up in Italy and she was everywhere when I was a kid. I know it sounds bad, but in Italy we had porn stars on our daytime TV invited to talk shows and um, she was a regular. She also became an Italian parliamentary member. Um, but in the, before, you know, after she became this massive uh, personality, she also married Jeff Koons. And uh, in 1989, they made this series of works called Made in Heaven. Now, you can imagine that Jeff Koons shocked the art world at the time because uh, everyone kept wondering if it was a prank. He's like, how could he possibly be marrying the biggest porn star in the world? He did. And what is he going to show us in this project? Well, he had a very interesting question. The question was, what is the dividing line between art and pornography? Why are we uh, prone to accept a naked body and people kissing, even naked, as art? But the very moment something else happens, we run away in fear, call it pornography, and don't want anything to do with it. So all I can show you here is really the most sedate and vanilla shots of the series. But at your own risk, you can go online and Google Jeff Koons, Made in Heaven. You might see a lot more. We're really talking about full-on pornography that was put on the walls <coughs> excuse me, that was put on the walls of the gallery space and that shocked people. Imagine walking into a gallery and just seeing what we're never used to see on the gallery wall and you're going there with your friends, you're going there with your family, hopefully not children because, you know, there was a, an announcement and a sign that prevented underage um, individuals from getting into the exhibition, but it was extremely embarrassing to explore that exhibition and I think there is something about that embarrassment that is really interesting about this question of what is the difference between art, eroticism, pornography and where do we draw the line and why. And on that note we've completed our journey through gender and sexuality. I hope you enjoyed. So if you want to follow me on Instagram you can find me at Dr. Aloy and on YouTube, if you Google my name, you will find other lectures on different subjects um, that you might enjoy also.